Good afternoon and welcome to CCK Live. Joining me today is Zachary Stoltz and Brad Hennings. In today's episode, we're discussing representation before the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. We're gonna break down different options for representation before the VA, what accreditation means, what about costs and fees? We're gonna discuss that as well and different types of representation. We're also gonna go over some important questions to ask a potential representative and red flags to be warned of and the benefits of having representation for your VA claim. Brad, can you start off by telling us what accreditation means and why it's important for a claimant or a veteran in a claim before the VA? Thanks, Robert. Accred accreditation is key. It's important to note you're represented. your representative must be accredited by VA. It is a requirement that the Department of Veteran Affairs have, has. And what that means is that person has the legal authority to prepare, present, and prosecute claims before VA on behalf of veterans, dependents, and their survivors. So these accredited representatives are trained to help claimants understand and pursue the VA benefits to them. So that raises the question of, well, how does this accreditation process work? What's involved? And what's involved is you have to, an individual has to apply to the VA Office of General Counsel. They have to provide self-certification of admission information concerning practice before any other court, bar, or state or federal agency. And that is if it is an attorney that's applying to be accredited. There has to be a determination, an affirmative determination of character and fitness by the VA. And if it is a non-attorney practitioner or non-attorney that's applying for accreditation, they have to take a written examination and pass that written examination. That examination deals with various aspects of the VA claims process, compensation, and pension programs that the VA has. Now, if someone is not accredited by VA, they are not allowed to represent veterans in this capacity. So no accreditation means they should not be representing veterans before VA. So how can you determine if your representative is accredited? And what you wanna do is you wanna to go to VA's website. The Office of General Counsel has a website where you can look and see who's accredited. And if your uh, representative is on there or your potential representative is on there, you are good to go. So Brad, I think it's important to emphasize that if someone is not accredited, they cannot represent someone before the VA. That applies to both agents that have to get accredited that applies to attorneys, they have to be accredited. Much like courts require attorneys to be admitted to them, for example, in different states, VA is exactly the same way. Um, even if it's you have a family lawyer, let's say, if they are not accredited by the VA, they will likely not be able to represent you in a VA claim. Zach, can you tell us the different types of accredited representatives that can potentially represent a veteran or a claimant before the VA? Yeah, it gets a little bit complicated um, because there are, there are several entities that, uh, that can represent veterans um, as well as individual attorneys and agents. And so the nomenclature can start to get a little bit confusing. There, uh, traditionally, who has represented veterans and who continue to do the bulk, frankly, of representation of veterans at the agency level, level are VSOs, which are Veterans Service Organizations. These places are, uh, are very familiar to most Americans. People see the American Legion doing its work, the Veterans of Foreign Wars doing its work, uh, the DAV, Disabled American Veterans, doing its work. These are Veterans Service Organizations. They are chartered by Congress um, and in particular, DAV has a very strong core of, of veteran service representatives who are licensed before the Department of Veterans Affairs by virtue of being affiliated with using DAV as our example with DAV. And they are able to be co-located at most regional offices uh, across the country. And they, are, they, tend to, they provide their services free of charge for veterans. Uh, and they have been, as I said, the traditional 
bulwark of representation of veterans claims across the country um, for, for many, many years. It is only pretty recently that attorneys and accredited agents have been uh, allowed into the process at the agency. They were always able to represent veterans free of charge, um, attorneys were, but it was not until uh, very recently that attorneys were able to start charging fees and therefore became a little bit more enticed to do work at the agency level. Um, so people should be aware of veteran service organizations. These veteran service organizations operate sometimes at the county level as well as at a national level. And they are able, again, through their affiliation with, with the veteran service organization, these veteran service representatives are able to go ahead and help veterans through, their, through the claims process. Um, a difference between them, uh, aside from the charging of fees, most agents and attorneys in our experience are gonna wanna charge fees because this, that's how they are able to make a living at representing veterans. Another key difference between the two, when a veteran or a veteran's spouse or whomever is going to enter the VA process executes a 22A, which is the form that we use to designate who is representing the veteran before the agency, they're able to designate DAV, for example, or VFW to represent them. Um, whereas for an agent or an attorney, they need to actually have the name of that agent or attorney. For example, in our case, Robert Chisholm <laughs> is the person on the 22A that represents that veteran. There are several movements afoot to, to maybe get that changed, but as of right now, the 22A designates an individual. And you're gonna to wanna to do that as Brad said, whether you uh, choose to retain an accredited agent or an attorney, if you are not being represented by the by ABSO, you wanna make sure that you have an individual named on the 22A, the person that you want to represent you. It can get a little bit confusing, uh, but be sure that you do that. And again, be sure to check, make sure that the person is an accredited agent with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, the last thing you wanna do is start going down the road with somebody who may not have some experience in this or who may just not ever be, re be recognized by VA to be able to properly handle your case. Um, see the CAVC, the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, also allows, it is one of the very few uh, federal courts in our country that allows for non-attorneys to represent you at court. However, unlike at the agency level, which is the regional office or Board of Veterans Appeals, that's what I mean when I say agency level, when you get to the next step of the appeals process, which is the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, you can have a non-attorney represent you. But that non-attorney needs to be able to be affiliated with an actual licensed attorney to sign the, to sign the pleadings um, for you. So it gets a little bit complicated at the CABC. You're going to want to really be careful about who you, who you choose to trust with that, with that part of the process. Um, but it is something that, that is an interesting part of veterans law is that that federal court does allow non-attorneys to practice before it. And there are several that are licensed to practice there and do a very, very nice job on behalf of our nation's veterans. Zach, uh, you mentioned um, the forms that are required to be signed in order for a veteran or a claimant to be represented before the VA. And there's really two different forms here. Um, if a veteran or a claimant wants to be represented by a veteran service organization, they need to sign what's called a VA form 21-22. And if a veteran or claimant wants to hire a and have a attorney or accredited representative agent uh, represent them before the VA, they need to sign a different form, a 2122A. And unless one of these forms are signed, the VA will not recognize either the veteran service organization or an attorney or an accredited agent. So I think it's really important to point out that a person could sign a fee agreement that says, um, I agree to represent claimant A in this matter before the VA, but unless and until that person also signs a VA form 2122A, VA will not recognize and allow that person to be represented by an attorney or an agent. So make sure that you sign one of these two forms when you hire either a VSO or an attorney or an agent.
Brad, this leads us really to the next step in the process when you're hiring um, a VSO or an attorney and agent. And can you talk a little bit about how fees and or costs work in the VA system? Yeah, I think there's something really important to note up front, and that is that no one can charge veterans for assistance in filing initial claims, and no one can take any portion of your future VA monthly payments. It's really important because there's folks out there who don't necessarily abide by that. And can, can you just describe what you mean or what VA means when we're talking about an initial claim? Because I think that can be confusing to people. Um, it, what they're talking about is when a veteran files a claim for a benefit, let's say benefits for their back condition that they um, incurred during their service, uh, they file an initial claim requesting benefits and VA then ultimately issues a rating decision. And um, so that that's really what um, VA is talking about there. It's prior to any of these cases being on appeal, as we call them. But there's no problem with uh, a veteran or a claimant going to an attorney or a VSO and having them help with the initial claim as long as there's no fee charge. Exactly. They can certainly assist, but you can't base your fee upon any of the work done prior to that initial claim. Um, and I think that's, that's really important because the only people who can legally charge fees in the VA system are accredited attorneys and accredited claims agents. Veteran service organizations, as Zach said, like our friends at, at DAV, they do not charge fees associated with this. And again, there's, there's a lot of folks out there who um, do charge fees prior to an initial claim. They are not accredited. And according to VA, that is not allowed by the law. The statute does not permit uh, charging those kinds of fees. So that gets into, okay, well, what kind of, how much can an agent or attorney charge? And the regulations that VA put forward that says that fees that don't exceed 20% of any past due benefits will be presumed to be reasonable if the agent or attorney provided representation that continued through the date of the decision awarding benefits. So most of the time when attorneys or agents are representing veterans at VA, um, they're engaged in what we call a contingency fee arrangement, meaning that a veteran wins uh, their case, they get retroactive benefits, meaning benefits that go back to their date of claim, and the attorney or agent is entitled to a percentage of those benefits, and that is the total fee. It does not affect any of the veteran's compensation on a monthly basis going forward. So it's presumed that anything uh, up to 20% is presumed reasonable, and fees which exceed 33.33% or 33 and a third, anything that exceeds that are presumed to be unreasonable. That being said, there are times where um, it will be found to be reasonable. We're just talking about presumptions and the same thing with the 20%. If you take a 20% fee and have literally done nothing, and I mean nothing in the case, that may not be reasonable. But generally speaking, those are the guidelines. So Brett, I just wanna make sure that I have this down and that veterans and claimants understand that, generally speaking, an agent or attorney is gonna charge a contingency fee out of the retroactive amount of the benefits. So if someone is charging fees out of future benefits, so you get an award, an increase say from 50 to 100%, and someone wants a portion of that for four years into the future, that's not allowed. That's correct. That is prohibited by law. You cannot, tr you can only receive a fee on these lump sums of retroactive benefits, and you can't charge for the benefits that the veteran is going to receive into the future. Um, Zach, that brings us to what factors will VA look at to determine whether a fee is reasonable or not? Yeah, this can become um, a, a pretty interesting area pretty quickly because. The fact is that agents and attorneys tend to work almost exclusively uh, on contingency agreements in this line of work. It's like a plaintiff's type of, of law. And so as Brad and Robert both talked about, uh, both agents and attorneys, when acting ethically, are going to take a percentage of past due benefits awarded as a fee. But that's not the end of the story because different amounts of work go into different amounts of 
uh, victories and, and there it can become complicated pretty quickly. And so you need to look at a little bit of a totality of the situation to determine what is in fact reasonable. Um, and so I have them written down here. So excuse me while I make sure that I follow my notes so that I don't miss any of them. Uh, courts have struggled with this for, for many decades now. Um, there's a lot of cases from both the federal circuit and the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims about this. And then there is there are also ethical rules of reasonableness um, that attorneys are held to from which VA kind of gets the guidelines that it employs to ensure that somebody is charging you a reasonable fee. Um, they look at the extent and the type of service a representative performed, the complexity of the case, and many veterans cases get extremely complex very, very quickly, which uh, helps for agents and attorneys to be entitled to the fee that they charge, the level of skill and competence required of the representative in giving the services, the amount of time the representative spent on the case, the results the representative achieved, including the amount of any benefits recovered, the level of review to which the claim was taken and the level of the review at which the representative was retained. That's a fancy way of saying, how many different levels of appeal did you go through? Um, whether it was something that happened very quickly at the regional office level or whether there was an appeal involved to a higher level review in the, in the uh, new system or to the Board of Veterans Appeals or to the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims or to the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit or to the United States Supreme Court. By the time you get through all of these many years of litigation, if unfortunately it becomes necessary, obviously that would mitigate in favor of a representative being able to be entitled to the full fee that he or she agreed uh, to with, 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 the, with the veteran. Uh, rates charged by other representatives for similar services, whether and to what extent the payment of fees is contingent upon the results achieved, and if applicable, the reasons why an agent or attorney was discharged or withdrew from representation before the date of the decision awarding benefits. And this really, frankly, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, veterans attorneys and their agents have agreed to a reasonable fee. The attorney or agent does a really nice job for the veteran. The veteran's not gonna have any problem paying the fee. However, that's not how, it, that's not how life works sometimes. And sometimes uh, an attorney may be discharged the veteran becomes dissatisfied with his or her representation. Uh, you can fire your lawyer. You can fire your agent. You can always. It's, this is this is all about the client, and and a veteran client can always fire somebody for whatever reason really they want to. However, once the attorney or agent is fired, it doesn't mean that they are not entitled to a fee that they may have worked on. And so VA will and the courts will look to see if an attorney or agent did some level of work that led to the ultimate award of benefits. And so even if you Fire an attorney, oftentimes the fired attorney will, will, will move on with their lives and both parties can proceed with representation that they are comfortable with. But occasionally there is gonna be um, a, a discharged attorney that's going to be entitled to a fee and be able to take that into account as well. So something to be aware of. Thank you, Zach. Um, we're gonna pivot now and talk about what questions you should ask when you're going to hire a representative. First, and most importantly, is this individual or organization accredited? And you can confirm that as Brad said, by looking up on the Office of General Counsel website to see whether they are accredited. When did they receive the accreditation? Was it a week ago? Was it a year ago? Was it five years ago, 10 years ago? And that gets to the next question is, how long have you been practicing veterans law? Veterans law is very dynamic it keeps changing. Why does it keep changing? For a few reasons. One, Congress keeps updating the statutes. So the most recent change was in how the whole appeal system worked. For over 50 years, there was one way to do appeals, but starting in February, 2019, everything changed. And we're in a new world of how appeals work. So you wanna have someone that understands both the old world and the new world. When was the last time this person attended a veteran's law training? Are they a member of the National Organizations of Veterans Advocates who do two seminars a year? Will this individual only represent me before the VA or will they also represent me, should we lose, at the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims or at the Federal Circuit? These are all things to consider um, in hiring a representative. Brad, 
Can you tell us uh, some of the benefits of having an accredited representative help on a case as opposed to going, in, going on your own, pro se? But one of the benefits of having an accredited representative is there's a certain amount of uh, quality assurance that, that's baked in that, that VA thinks is, is important. And the expectation is that if you've got an accredited representative, they're knowledgeable about VA claims, they're knowledgeable about the appeal system, they'll be good in helping you meet deadlines, and most importantly, they're going to be knowledgeable about helping you develop your claim, which is really key that they're gonna help you get medical records, service records, lay statements, expert reports potentially, and then shape this into the strongest claim possible so you can win the benefits that you're entitled to. In addition, an accredited attorney or agent can get access to the VA systems, which includes the Veterans Benefits Management System, which is now the electronic version of the Veterans Claims File. So they'll have real-time access to what's actually going on within VA's own systems. Non-accredited representatives cannot get that access. In fact, getting that access is, is very difficult even once you're accredited. It can take um, many layers of review. It can take months and months and months, but it's an incredibly important um, thing to be able to access the, the veteran or the, the client's records within the VA systems. You can also get status updates about your case uh, through an accredited representative. And most importantly, they're gonna help you fully pursue your claim to get you the maximum benefits available. Um, everything from potentially um, total disability to do, due to individual unemployability, maybe 100% rating, maybe different levels of special monthly compensation. What we're sharing here today and what we've shared here today is things to consider in hiring a representative. We talked about accreditation. We've talked about fees. We talked about the benefits of hiring someone who's accredited to help on a claim. Um, whichever path you choose, um, we believe that with the new appeal system, it's best to get some help and it's best to get someone who's accredited to help you whichever way you choose, whether it's a veteran service organization, an accredited agent, or an attorney. Uh, Zach, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? I do not. Good luck out there. This is a very complicated area of law, made much more complicated by Congress's recent actions uh, in, in uh, passing the Appeals, the Appeals Modernization Act. Hopefully what that all does is it does you know, it does end up helping veterans out, but for right now, it's a new system, and so it's going to be a little bit complicated, so careful out there. Brad, any final thoughts from you? Just uh, get an accredited representative, like you said, Robert. Uh, there's a lot of folks out there, unfortunately, who are not accredited, and I don't think that they're um, helping veterans in a way that's uh, meaningful or appropriate. Well, Zach, Brad, thank you both for joining us here at CCK Live. Um, please check out our blog, check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This is Robert Chisholm signing off from Chisholm, Chisholm, and Kilpatrick. Thank you all.